Hi, I'm Ricky. Today we are on the third episode of the Endless Runner series. In this episode, we'll face procedural generation and game states. Also, recently, Unity 2019.3 got a stable update, so we're gonna move our project to that version. To do that, it's really simple. We just download the latest Unity version. Mine is 2019.3.0 F6. Let's select our YouTube runner by clicking on the arrow and just move it to a new version. And then let's just open it. Unity is gonna warn you that it's gonna take a bit of time. Just say confirm. It's gonna ask you if you want to update the database version. Just say yes. Okay, and I'll meet you when it's done. So here we are, back in our Unity project. Today we'll make some scripts to have our procedural generation and also have a way to lose the game when we hit a rock. Before we do any of that stuff though, let's change the camera color background because it's really ugly right now. So let's go to the main camera and let's change the background color to pitch black. This is not of course the final product, but at least it's a bit better to see this way. Okay, so let's make a new empty object and we'll call it game manager and put it right here. When I have a lot of objects in my hierarchy, I like to make empty objects that have line separator. So new, empty, I just put some equal signs. Remember that these are just empty objects that act as uh, menus. So we can just select them, reset the position for safety measures, and also disable them. Okay, let's select our game manager. Let's reset the position of this object as well. I'm gonna make a new component, and we we'll call it spawn manager. Okay, let's open it up in Visual Studio. Okay, so in here, we're gonna need a lot of variables actually. So let's get to working. First, we're gonna need a reference to the objects that we want to spawn. So our booties and the rock. To do so, we make an array of game object. So, serialize field, private, game object, and we say entities prefabs. Okay, so this way we have an array of game object that we call entities prefabs that we are gonna fill with the booty and the rock in the inspector. And if we hit save and go back to Unity, as you can see now we have a new entities prefabs value in here and we can fill it with the prefabs that we made recently. To do so, we, you know, we open our prefab folder, we select our game manager, and we want to actually lock our current inspector. So then we can select both our booty and our rock together and drag them in. There we go. Okay, now back to our script. We want to have a value that determines how often we want to spawn our entities. So serialized field, private, float and we'll say spawn timer. We also want another value for spawn timer so that when the timer goes to zero, it resets to the original value. So we just duplicate that with control D and we say spawn timer max. Okay, and we set the default value to 0.5. Okay, so now we need an update method in which we decrease the spawn timer to spawn an item. So update if spawn timer major than zero, spawn timer minus equals time dot delta time else we reset the timer so spawn timer equals spawn timer max and we spawn an object so spawn here let's actually make a new function to spawn our entity so we say private void spawn entity and in here we'll just say spawn entity and we call this function Okay, so now every half a second, this function is gonna be called. We're gonna use a function called instantiate, written like so. But this function needs a game object and a position in which to spawn it. So let's make our new vector three. I will say serialized field, private, vector three. I will call it spawn position. Okay, let's go back to our inspector. And now we want to set the spawn position to be somewhere around here, just outside of the screen, right in the middle. So to do that, we'll take uh, an object, we we'll just take it here, and we see it's uh, six on the Y. I think it's good, okay. So to our game manager, spawn manager, we we'll set the Y on six. And for the Z, it doesn't really matter, but it's better if we set it to one. 
Okay, so let's go back to Visual Studio. Okay, so now we have a position in which to spawn our entity, but we also need to know which entity to spawn. To do so, we'll use random.range. So let's go back to spawn entity and we say game object entity to spawn equals entities prefabs. And in here, instead of give it a fixed value, we say random.range zero entities prefabs dot length. Okay, so this way we're gonna get a random game object inside our game object array because it's gonna give us a random value from zero to the maximum value of that array. Okay, so now we have our game object, but I also want to randomize the position on the x-axis of our spawn position. To do that, we're gonna need a new value. So in here we say serialize field private float x margin. And we'll set this to default to two. Let's go back to Unity. Okay, so we're gonna use our x margin to tell the spawn manager how far from the center the game object can be spawned. Okay, so we've picked a rock for reference. This is on the zero center. If you go to minus two, this is how far it's gonna be able to spawn. It's actually a bit too far, so I think it's better if you go like this, so minus 1.8. So let's go back to our game manager and we set the X margin to 1.8. And then inside our script, we are gonna say spawn position dot x equals random dot range and then we say minus x margin plus x margin. So it's gonna be a random value in between minus 1.8 and 1.8. Okay, so now we have both our game object and our spawn position correctly, so we just need to instantiate. So we say instantiate and we'll feed it our entity spawn and our spawn position. It's also going to require a transform rotation, but for now we just give it a quaternion zero, so quaternion.identity. You can also write quaternion.euler000, but it's actually the same thing as writing quaternion.identity. Okay, let's go back to Unity, and it should work in theory. Let's try it. Yep, it works! Right now it's got uh, something of a waterfall effect, kind of like everything is cascading down onto us. That is because entities aren't actually moving through uh, artificial force, they are moving because of gravity. And we want to change that. So let's exit our playthrough. And before we go any further, let's actually remove all these entities here. Let's go to our prefabs and change a couple of things. Okay, so let's select both our booty and our rock. And inside our rigid body 2D, we want to change the angular drag to zero and the gravity scale to zero. We also want to interpolate from none to extrapolate. Okay, so now we want to actually change something in the project settings, which is this window right here. If you don't have it, you can just go to File, Build Settings, Player Settings, and it's gonna open automatically. In here, we want to go to Time, I want to change the fixed time step from 002 to 001. And this is gonna make everything a lot smoother because right now our sprites were kinda of jittering. With this uh, fix, it should go a bit better. Okay, but now our entities will actually be immobile because we are not giving it a force. So when we spawn our object, we want to say, hey, start moving. Okay, so let's go back to our script and let's add a new value that's gonna determine how fast our entities go. So we say, serialized field, private, float, entities, speed. And we'll set this value default to 50, okay? So when we spawn our object, we want to give them a force equal to our entity speed. To do that, we need a reference to our spawned object. So we say, game object spawned entity equals to instantiate. This way we have a reference to the object we just spawned. And then we say, spawned entity dot get component rigid body 2d dot velocity equals new vector 2. Okay, so we set a new velocity for rigid body of our spawned entity and we set this value to 0 for the x and entity speed on the y. We also want to reverse this value. Okay, so let's try that. Hit play. And whoa, okay, too fast, too fast. 
let's change our entity speed to 6 over 7 because I pressed 7. Okay, much better. You can change this value even during gameplay, as you can see. Whee! I'll slow it down. You can also reverse it and then it is going to go up. As you can see, it works. Okay, so with this simple spawn measure, we have something of a game right here. I want to actually make a loose condition and also a start condition so that the game doesn't start automatically, but only when we want to. To do so, we're going to need two scripts. The first one is going to call start game manager and the second is finish game manager. Okay, let's open our start game manager. And in here, we want a function that when true, it's going to start the game. To do so, we just go on the update method. I will say if input.getKeyDown and for uh, debugging, we'll say L. While if we are on the mobile, we'll say input.touchCount major than zero. So if we are on the computer and we press L or if we are on the mobile and we touch the screen, we want something to happen and we'll say private void start game okay so we want this function to tell the other scripts to start running in this case we only need the spawn manager so we need something to block the spawn manager until the start game manager says to go so let's go back to our spawn manager and let's add a new value always serialized field private boo and we'll call it can spawn and we also want a new function that tells our spawn manager to start spawning. So we say public void start script. Okay, and in here we just say can spawn equals true. And if we want, we can also change the spawn timer here. Because right now, as soon as we start spawning, the spawn timer is at ready at zero and it's gonna spawn automatically. So let's actually reset our spawn timer at the start. So spawn timer equals spawn timer max. Okay, we could just make this value public and change it from the start game manager, but this way, with it being private, we always know when and how it's gonna change. Of course, that is with the start script function. So now we need a reference for spawn manager from the start game manager. To do so, we're gonna use something called singleton. Singleton is a way to organize our game manager scripts which is really, really nice and really, really easy to use. To make a singleton, you just go at the start of a script and you write public spawn manager instance. So we make a new public instance of our class that we are already in it. And we want to make this instance static. A static class can be called from any other class from anywhere, as long as it's public, of course. And you can call anything inside this static class from anywhere as long as its values are public. This sounds a bit complicated, but what this means is that inside your start game manager, we can just say spawn manager dot instance dot start script. We don't need to make a new reference to our spawn manager. We can just say spawn manager dot instance. It's gonna take this value right here which is going to give us all the public values that we have inside. In this case, the only public value we have is this function right here, start script. But right now, this instance of the spawn manager is actually empty. To fill it, we just need to say on awake instance equals this. So awake instance equals this. And that's it. That's all you need to do to make a singleton. You can make singletons with anything as long as you know for sure that you're only gonna have one instance of that class. So for things like spawn manager, it's perfect because you're always gonna need one. While for things like player control, if you're a multiplayer, or for entity scripts, if you have a lot of entities, you can't use singletons. Only when you have one instance of that class. Okay. This was a bit complicated, but it's actually really, really, really easy and helpful once you get it. Okay, and in here we want to make our script disabled when the can spawn value is false. So in our update method, we actually want to wrap all this code in a new function. We say private void chai spawn. And we'll copy all this. And in an update we call it. 
okay and in here we say if can spawn is false return so if the can spawn value is false we're just gonna return return means that we're gonna exit the function so all of these won't be executed okay so let's go back to unity and let's try this i hit play and nothing is happening but if i press l it's gonna start spawning and as you can see the entities are actually going really smooth and with a steady velocity okay so last thing we're gonna do is a finish game manager so let's go to our finish game manager script let's remove everything and let's make a singleton so public static finish game manager instance and we make a public function called finish game okay so we want to call this function when we want to lose when we want a game over to do so we go to our bot collision and remember when we put a debug log with you lost we are actually going to remove this and we're going to say finish game manager dot instance dot finish game okay so this way whenever we enter an entity that has a rock id we'll call the finish game manager we'll call its instance and we'll say finish the game so in our finish game manager we'll say time dot time scale equals zero so what this does is it's setting the natural value of time inside of game to zero this means that everything is going to be standing still it's like pressing the pause button remember to also give the instance value to your script by saying on awake instance equals this okay so if we go back to unity we hit play we can move if we press l it's gonna start spawning and if we hit the rock the game stops perfect okay we don't have a way to restart the game right now we'll see this in the next episode I think we saw a lot of stuff today, if you got any doubts please tell me in the comments. Alright, see you in the next video.